There's a revolution going on in PC gaming, and it's not where you might think. Sure, the bleeding edge continues to get sharper, but for me, the most exciting developments are happening in integrated graphics. iGPUs are better than ever, with enough performance to enable high-fidelity PC gaming experiences, even in the most unlikely of gaming PCs. Geekon provided me with their new A7 for review, though, as usual, my thoughts and opinions are my own, and I have to admit, I kinda love it already. It's not the smallest mini PC on the market, nor is it even the smallest with a Ryzen APU, but it's still disarmingly compact and stylish. If not for the reflective Geekom logo, you could mistake it for one of Johnny Ive's creations. And that's probably intentional. A lot of people are attracted to the Mac Mini for its appearance, but are put off by the price, especially when you get into the upgrades. Windows Mini PCs usually beat Macs for value, but often miss the point when it comes to aesthetics, so this not entirely original approach might help Geekon pick up a few extra customers for whom an aluminium chassis and unibody design are non-optional. As I mentioned already, the A7 is an AMD powered unit, using the Ryzen 9 7940HS. This 4 nanometer Zen 4 chip has 8 processing cores with SMT, 16 megs of L3 cache, and a TDP of 35 to 54 watts. That last part will prove to be the most significant to the system's overall performance, because while the 7940HS can technically clock up to 5.2GHz, the reality of an APU in a small form factor PC is that it will rarely get that high. The Ryzen 9 backs up this shackled beast of a CPU with a surprisingly powerful GPU. The Radeon 780M is based on RDNA3 architecture, meaning it has hardware accelerated AV1 encoding and decoding for video streaming and content creation, and gaming performance on par with some entry-level discrete graphics cards. This alone sets it apart from Intel's existing CPUs built for mobile and small form factor PCs, at least until Meteor Lite starts to hit the market. Of course, there's more to a mini PC than its CPU and integrated graphics. Priced at £799, with a £20 early bird discount if you're buying around the time I upload, the top spec A7 comes loaded with 32 gigs of DDR5 5600 RAM and a 2 terabyte Gen 4 NVMe SSD, though it's also available in a Ryzen 7 model with a 1 terabyte drive for £649 before discounts. For your money, the A7 comes with pretty much all the features you'd expect from a modern mini PC, particularly a more premium model. On the front, there's a pair of USB 3.2 Type-A ports, one PD enabled, and a 3.5mm combo jack. On the back, there's a pair of HDMI 2 ports, a pair of Type-C ports, both of which support display and power delivery, but one of them's a 10 gigabit USB 3.2, the other a 40 gigabit USB 4. There's another pair of Type-A ports, one 3.2, the other USB 2, as well as a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port and a barrel jack for the included power supply. Finally, even in this smaller form factor, Geekom have still found room for a full-size SD reader on the side, which I always love to see. Internally, in addition to the socketed RAM, we have a Wi-Fi card that supports the 6E standard as well as Bluetooth 5.2. Disappointingly, there's nothing included in the way of storage expansion on this model, as there's no internal M.2 SATA support or additional NVMe slots, and the required ribbon cable to attach a 2.5 inch drive is an optional extra. If you want a bigger drive for your A7, you'll either have to replace the stock one, spring for the SATA cable, or use external drives. Accessing these internals is also not quite as simple as with Geekom's Mini IT series. Unlike those Intel NUC style machines, the screws aren't easily undone by screwdriver or even by hand. Instead, they're hidden behind some rubber feet, which clip in and are held down with sticky tape, and which require a smaller driver to unscrew. Presumably this is all done in the name of aesthetics, but I can't help but feel this is a recipe for losing a foot. 
Also, removing the bottom panel isn't enough. There's a second metal plate that also needs unscrewing before any of the user upgradable components are accessible. And given some of the other designs I've seen lately, this is hard to defend. It's presumably for a two and a half inch drive to attach to, but given the absence of any included way to connect that drive, this is just a pain in the ass, frankly. Because my channel is focused on gaming hardware, and because this is one of the rare occasions I get my hands on a mini PC with a relatively high performance iGPU, I'm going to kick off with some more demanding games. And for reasons that will become apparent soon, I've included two sets of numbers for each game. One for how they perform out of the box, and one with some tuning done using the Universal x86 tuning utility. I used UXTU to make a custom profile, fixing 45 and 55 watt TDP limits, extending their boost durations, and applying a 25 millivolt undervolt to the curve optimizer. You've probably heard two things about Alan Wake 2. One, that it won a ton of awards, and two, that it's a real bastard to run on low-end hardware. With that in mind, it's probably pretty surprising to see it running at all on any kind of iGPU. And it's true, but I couldn't help but notice that in my first test, it could have done better. Shortly into the test, the game started exhibiting a sort of square waveform pattern in the frame time graph, which meant gameplay was basically limping along. Applying the UXTU tuning profile seemed to help somewhat. Average FPS wasn't changed much by this, still hovering in the low 30 range, but 1% lows gained over 30% and became much more tolerable. I still haven't actually started playing Avatar Cry because every GPU I've tested so far this year has been well under the recommended specs. So, Again, I've just got footage from the canned benchmark run for you to enjoy. Sorry. Anyway, the results at 1080 low with FSR performance don't look promising, averaging an appropriately cinematic 24 FPS, but with lows of just 10. Applying the UXTU profile helps a little, especially at the low end, but I'm still not sure this is really playable stuff. Starfield's on slightly steadier ground. I can afford to run at the medium preset using 75% upscaling, which is roughly analogous to FSR Ultra quality. This doesn't look too bad, but shadows become extremely grainy, so maybe low without upscaling might be a more palatable alternative. The average at these settings just about scrapes 30 FPS in New Atlantis, so we'll do much better on other, less dense planets. Oddly enough, tuning the TDP and voltage actually didn't do a thing. From the start, Resident Evil 4 Remake was a mess. Even before I started my test run, the game was sluggish and laggy as all hell, and it never settled down. Although I did manage to complete my benchmark, it was a painful experience. Averages were somehow in the 30s, however the 1% lows were below 1 frame per second. Again, the performance problems manifested in a sort of square wave pattern on the frame time graph, so I applied the UXTU profile to see if that fixed the issue, and it did. At first. Before long, the 1% lows started to drop again, sending performance into the gutter. I didn't experience this issue on the B-Link with the Ryzen 7 7840HS, so there's probably a way of getting around this. Maybe some more adventurous APU tuning would help, but that's maybe something for another video. The Last of Us was actually the first game I tested, and the one that inspired me to try the Universal x86 tuning utility on the A7. It started just fine, walking through the forest, talking to Ellie, but by around the halfway point, the now familiar limping frame times occurred. Turning on UXTU seemed to fix it, though after seeing how RE4 panned out, it might be the case that in a longer gaming session, the problems arise again. Anyway, from the data I gathered with the UXTU tuning, The Last of Us runs almost 20% faster on average and 67% faster at the low end. However, even with these more relaxed TDP limits, the Ryzen 9 doesn't match the performance I saw from the Ryzen 7 in the B-Link CS7, so clearly there's more that can be extracted from this APU if it can get more power and more cooling.
on a quick tangent, it's interesting to me that the last discrete GPU I tested, the Radeon RX 6300, couldn't run Ratchet & Clank at native resolution at all. With the low preset, I needed ultra-performance FSR upscaling to get even 15 frames per second, and the game looked like trash. Meanwhile, on these integrated graphics, I saw a pretty acceptable 32 FPS average, and the game looked frankly excellent. Again, the tuning utility didn't really do anything to help performance, so getting any higher FPS than this is going to take some upscaling. So far I've focused on modern, highly demanding titles that firmly belong in the current generation category. Forza Horizon 5, however, is more of a cross-gen title from 2021, and one that scales nicely across a range of hardware. Therefore, it's not all that surprising that integrated graphics can run the benchmark demo at 60fps. What is surprising is that the 780M can manage it at a full 1080p without upscaling, with temporal anti-aliasing, and the high presets. Tuning the TDP can actually give a respectable 4% bump to the average FPS too. For some reason, I couldn't get Fortnite to run. Not for hardware reasons, at least I don't think so. The game would allow me into the lobby and into the prep area, but as soon as the battle bus took off, I got dumped back to the lobby again with an error message. I verified the files, I uninstalled and reinstalled the game, I re-downloaded the streamable assets… nothing. Oh well. It looks like it can run well over 100 FPS in performance mode, and the last time I tested this iGPU in DX12, I saw 96 FPS at competitive settings. On a happier note, Apex Legends… oh wait, no, I hate this game. Anyway, Apex works just fine and even looks pretty decent. At 1080 low, with textures turned up a smidge, it averaged somewhere just below the 100fps mark at the stock profile. The main effect from running UXTU was to improve frame pacing, as while the averages benefited a little from the extra boost, the big winner was 1% lows, which climbed by about 35%. Counter-Strike 2, more like confounding results 2. Actually, although I always test in Dust 2 Deathmatch, there's bound to be some variability in results, but it's noteworthy that using UXTU actually saw a small drop in frame rates. The average at stock settings hit 141, with lows of 79. When benchmarking with the tuned TDP settings, it lost 5% on average and over 10% on the low end. Curious, but not crazy, it's still a very playable result either way. Overwatch 2 made a little more sense. At 1080 low settings, the average at stock was 91 FPS, with 1% lows of 46. Tuning the boost duration up and the voltage offset down gained 10% on average and just under 10% on the percentile lows. And with that, I have a problem. That's all the fun stuff covered, and all that's left to talk about is productivity and synthetics. Well, I've got a bit of a cold, and I've been doing a lot of these lately, so I'm just going to let the numbers speak for themselves this time.
quick note on heat and power. Uh, I ran with the fan set to the performance setting in the BIOS, which is actually still pretty inconspicuous, but also doesn't move a lot of air. If you're going to do a lot of CPU heavy work on this PC, you'll need to get used to temps hanging around the 99 degree mark, unless you use UXTU to manually drop the thermal limit to a less scary number. Power consumption during gaming tends to vary between 75 and 80 watts, and at full load it can spike up close to 90 watts. This is actually a little below the B-Link Seer 7. Anyway, uh, after all that, I guess you want a conclusion. Well, I like it, but then again, I didn't have to buy it. If it were my money, I'd still be interested, but I'd probably save myself 150 quid and get the Ryzen 7 model, and maybe upgrade it myself with RAM and storage later if I needed it. There are links in the description for the UK, US and Australia if you're interested in picking up an A7 for yourself, as well as a discount code if the early bird promo has ended by the time you see this video. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.